Have you been searching the internet for useful endo videos? I'll tell you I have, and I still do every day. And you know what? I've learned so much from several YouTubers, and I really wanted to share those videos with you. They honestly have changed my practice, and I hope they'll change yours as well. Let's watch my top five YouTube endo videos for 2019. I'm Ash from All Things Dentistry and I'm passionate about sharing those unwritten tips and hints in dentistry. If you want to learn more about endo, check out my endo gear guide which is listed below in the description and in the cards above. Let's jump into number five. That makes me very suspicious. Alright, so what's this? What is this? <laughs> it's nasty. It's nasty. <laughs> yeah, you bring me very special Miami special teeth. CSI Miami teeth. <laughs> well, this is okay. probably a little job, but I, are you getting the idea? Yeah. I don't know that we should spend all no, no, the time, no, but I but uh, but I can get through this one. This one's a keeper. And then if we look at the root, yeah, it's a big, 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 big root. I don't know that I can tell you I immediately see the foramen. There's one there. Yeah, if we played around, we, we, we could get through it, but it's, uh, just take the burr and Boom, 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 and and did you see? As the burr comes across the floor, it makes dust, and the dust goes into an anatomical space, and you saw a little white dot, and that white dot gave me confidence. That's where it is. Okay. Everything else was smooth and shiny and and kind of brownish, straw colored, but there was like a white dot, and that's because as I took the burr and swept it back and forth, the byproduct of the dental dust went into the little orifice and it marked it. We call that the white line test or the white dot test. If it's bleeding in a vital case, it's red. If it's necrotic, it's white. So those are, if you go to my website, you can download like the 14 ideas for finding calcified, aberrant, or previously missed canals. And it tells you all these white line, red line, yeah. rules of symmetry, okay? Here, you take your famous dude. <laughs> Hi, John Rhodes here. What do you do if the working length is longer than your master cone? Do they make longer GP cones? Well, the answer is no. It's actually very easy to adapt the existing cones to make them longer. This doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's very helpful to be able to modify the existing cone so that it fits to the full working length. Hope you enjoy it. So to do this, I'm going to use the rough side of my engineering ruler. The one that I use for measuring files during root canal treatment. Here is a master cone from the Wave 1 Gold system. It has a useful working length of about 27 millimeters. Using the rough side of the engineering ruler, I can roll it on the work surface and thin the thickest end. The result is a cone which has a working length in excess of 32 millimeters. Thank you. 
And today's tip is about anesthesia. Are you still using paddle shots to anesthetize patients for maxillary first or second molars? Well, I'm here to tell you that's not necessary. To, in order to do a root canal therapy on a maxillary first or second molar, you need to get the paddle root numb, obviously. Buccal infiltration is not enough because the paddle root could be so far away that you're not going to get adequate infiltration to anesthetize that root. So many people actually end up giving a patient a paddle shot, but that's really not necessary. If you give a posterior superior alveolar nerve block, whereby you actually are anesthetizing the posterior superior alveolar nerve before it enters the maxilla, uh, you will be able to numb up all three roots of the maxillary first and second molars. And occasionally for the maxillary first molar, you may have to just give a little additional buccal infiltration. So what that does is it allows you to uh, anesthetize your first and second molars only with a posterior superior alveolar nerve block, which is a fairly easy shot to give. All it requires you to do is to aim for it. In a different uh, tutorial, we'll obviously go into detail about how you can administer the posterior superior alveolar nerve block safely and very uh, painlessly to your patients. But the question that comes up is that, well, what about the clamp right before you put on? You'd need to have anesthesia on the paddle uh, tissue for clamping the, the, uh, the tissue. Well, most of the time, you get enough collateral innervation with the posterior superior alveolar nerve block that the clamp could be applied uh, to the paddle tissue and it won't cause any pain. But in those cases where there could be a little bit of a pinch felt by the patient, all you need to do is just to give one additional um, drop of anesthetic in form of a interligamental shot right in the paddle area right before you start. So you would start by giving the posterior superior alveolar nerve block for your maxillary second molar and your first molar, and then proceed to give maybe a half a carpule or one carpule of buccal infiltration only for your first molar. And then right before you start, you just give a couple of drops of anesthetic in the mesial or distal uh, uh, line angle of the paddle area, uh, right in the, uh, into the sulcus before you get started, only if the clamp is pinching on the tissue. This way, you can make your maxillary molar uh, anesthetic uh, shots painless, quick, and uh, without that dreaded paddle of shots. Is hydraulic condensation using bioceramic cements a single cone technique? This is the topic of this week's Friday question. Bioceramic sealer has now been around for nearly nine years, and while the obturation technique developed by Rewold Endo to optimize and to implement the sealer's use responsibly has now gained widespread popularity, I still get the occasional question of, is this a single cone technique, and how about filling in 3D or three dimensions, and what about the lateral canals? Well, many people don't seem to understand the concept of hydraulic condensation and why it works the way it does. So in this video, I hope to basically clarify some of these questions and confusions for you. First, I think that we need to revisit and look historically at the obturation techniques and for a minute and just kind of get a little clarification about the term single cone. The term dates all the way back to the 1950s and 60s when we had to use a single cone of an O2 tapered uh, gutta percha cone in a variably tapered canal that was instrumented using hand files and gates glittons, and then we had to use zinc oxide eugenol cement uh, to fill the large gaps that presented. Predictably, this technique failed because of the O2 taper gutta percha cone in a variably tapered preparation that left a lot of space around the cone that then needed to be filled with this sealer. And using zinc oxide eugenol as a sealer means getting dramatic shrinkage upon setting. Furthermore, uh, zinc oxide eugenol resorbs both from outside as well as the inside of the root canal in areas where it pools, leaving large gaps uh, down the line. So as a result of these two specific limitations of zinc oxide eugenol cement, the single cone technique failed and the profession developed the axiom of minimizing the sealer interface, uh, which uh, meant that we really had to condense gutta percha or thermoplasticize it and the term single cone became associated with a lower quality obturation. So the profession moved on to using lateral condensation and vertical condensation to compensate for this limitations of uh, the sealer that we were using, namely zinc oxide eugenol. 
Now, 10 years ago, when Bioceramics finally became available as a sealer, and the properties seemed to be much better than both zinc oxide original as well as the resin-based sealers, we here at Rewild Endo decided to revisit the old concept of single cone and see how it works with this specific sealer. So we understood why the original single cone didn't work, which was really because of the limitations of the sealer that was being used at the time. So in this version, the bioceramic doesn't really act as a sealer. It really acts as a root canal filler. In reality, the gutta percha is merely a carrier as well as a path for retreatment in case it's needed down the line. So in hydraulic condensation, the sealer is what really seals the root canal. It's not the gutta percha. So for those proponents of thermoplastic gutta percha and thermoplastic carriers, what we need to have them answer is the following question. What's really so special about gutta percha? And what material should really fill and seal the spaces around the main carrier core cone? Should it be thermoplastic gutta percha or uh, will the bioceramic sealer do? So, of course, lots of scientific support is present to support the superiority of bioceramics over gutta percha. In fact, uh, there are five major advantages to bioceramic sealer and cements compared to thermoplastic gutta percha. For example, Biceramic sealer does not shrink, but thermoplastic gutta percha shrinks 2 to 7% upon cooling. Biceramic sealer is antimicrobial to, the, to its high pH, but thermoplastic gutta percha is not. It's inert. Biceramic sealer bonds to dentin, but thermoplastic gutta percha doesn't bond. Biceramic sealer has better uh, flow properties than thermoplastic gutta percha. It doesn't get hard very quickly upon cooling. And biceramic sealer is hydrophilic. And last, the bioceramic sealer technique hydraulic condensation is a lot easier clinically and much more efficient to implement than any of these lateral and vertical condensation techniques. So based on these characteristics, it's much better to fill the canal with bioceramic sealer than it is to use gutta percha. So in fact, there's really no reason to use thermoplastic gutta percha anymore since the problem that led to the development of thermoplastic gutta percha, which was the lack of quality sealers, has now been resolved. So it actually brings up the following question. Why use gutta percha at all? Well, Rebel Dendo uses a responsible technique, I mean, this hydraulic condensation technique, which means that the root canal should have a chance to be retreated. And this is why hydraulic condensation was developed with the main cone of gutta percha as the main filler. So the gutta percha is used because it has really two functions only. It acts as a carrier to take the sealer to the full working length, that therefore it gives you some length control, and it also acts as a path for retreatment. That's all. And we believe that, import, uh, that the tooth has to be retreatable because we know that cases fail not so much because of the obturation technique that you use, but because of your ability to, or inability to completely clean and disinfect the root canal. So if you focus on cleaning and disinfecting the root canal completely, vast majority of cases succeed, but we want to make sure that we present and share a technique that is retreatable so that if someone with less experience were to do a root canal and wouldn't be able to completely clean the root canal, an endodontist or someone with more experience would still be able to retreat it. And hydraulic condensation is retreatable uh, without a doubt. This is the case of a maxillary right canine tooth. Following instrumentation with the endosequence uh, instrumentation system, a size 60 endosequence gutta percha cone is fitted to 26 millimeters, which is the working length of this tooth. After drying the canal, bioceramic sealer is dispensed into the dispensing tip, and the master apical file is then dipped into the dispensing tip of the syringe and after full coating it is inserted into the canal to full working length and rotated in a counterclockwise direction. This facilitates the coating of the canal in a very clean and predictable manner. After coating the canal with the endosequence master file, the master cone is also in a similar fashion coated with the bioceramic sealer and slowly seated all the way to working length.
the Endo Pro 270 is then used to sear off the gutta percha cone at the RFS level. A condenser of appropriate size, in this case a size 10 plugger, is used then to condense the gutta percha cone apically. Following condensation, ultrasonic and water is used to clean the remaining debris on the walls. Care should be taken not to disturb the gutta percha with the ultrasonic, but rather to only touch the dent in walls. A provisional is then placed in the access opening or the core could be placed at that time. Thanks so much for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And we'll see you soon.